the universal impact of Edom's offense and Jesus Christ's righteousness, a biblical analysis. The spread of sin through the human race. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. The Apostle Paul regarded Genesis chapter 3 as totally historically true. According to Paul and Jesus, as he says in Matthew 19, 4 to 6, Adam and Eve were real people, and what they did has a lasting effect to the present day. It is important to understand that the Adam and Eve account is not an optional passage to be accepted or rejected or allegorized away. According to Paul's theme here in Romans chapter 5, you cannot take away Genesis 3 without taking away principles that lay the foundation for our salvation. According to Bruce, to Paul, Edom was more than a historical individual, the first man. He was also what his name means in Hebrew, humanity. The whole of humanity is viewed as having existed at first in Edom. Paul doesn't prove this. He simply accepts it through from Genesis 3. Sin entered the world through Edom. Significantly, Edom is responsible for the fall, not Eve. Eve was deceived when she sent, but Edom sent with full knowledge. First Timothy chapter 2 verse 14. God promised Edom, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Genesis 2.17. The principle of death was introduced into the world when Edom sent and it, was, and it has reigned on earth ever since. Every grave is mute evidence to the spread and reign of sin since the time of Edom. Since death and sin are connected, we can know that all men are sinners because all are subject to death. A sinless man is not subject to death, but since every person is subject to death, even the smallest baby, it proves that all mankind sinned in Edom. This sounds odd to our even individualistic ears, but Paul clearly teaches that we all sinned in Edom. Edom is the common father of every person on the earth. Every human who has ever lived was in Edom's genetic makeup. Therefore, all mankind actually sent in Edom. All sent, in this case means all sent in Edom, Adam's sin is the sin of all, according to Morris. Humans are mortal, subject to death, before they commit any sin themselves, since mortality is the result of sin. It shows that we are made sinners by Edom's sin, not by our own personal sin. We may not like the fact that we are made sinners by the work of another man. We may protest and say, I want to stand on my own two feet and not be made a sinner because of the work of another man. Nevertheless, it is fair to be made righteous by the work of another man only if we are also made sinners by the work of another man. If we are not made sinners by Edom, then it isn't, isn't fair for us to be made righteous by Jesus? This truth makes us uncomfortable, but it is still the truth. The smallest baby is a sinner, subject to death. David understand this when he wrote, Behold, I was brought forth in equity, and in sin my mother's conceived me. Psalm 51.5 We can also know that we are born sinners 
for other reasons. First, think of how selfish and angry the smallest baby can be. Second, think of how we never have to teach our children to be bad. They learn that quite on their own with old Edom teaching the lessons. If babies are sinners, does that mean that they go to hell? Not, necessar not necessarily. First, we know that the children of believers are sanctified by the presence of a believing parent. 1 Corinthians 7.14 Secondly, David had the assurance that his baby would meet, in, would meet him in heaven. 2 Samuel 12.23 Finally, we know that at the end of it all, God, the judge of the entire world, will do right. Genesis 18.25 If there are the children of unbelieving parents in heaven, it is important to understand that it is not because they are innocent. As sons and daughters of guilty Adam, we are each born guilty as well. If such children go, do, uh, go to heaven, it is not because the innocent, they are innocent to deserve heaven, but because the rich mercy of God has been extended to them as well. The phrase, until the law of sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when this, there is no law. We know that at the, at the root of it all, we are made sinners because of Edom and not because we break the law ourselves. We know this because sin and death were in this world before the law was ever given. The law was too late to prevent sin and death and it is too weak to save from sin and death. The phrase nevertheless death reign, the total merciless reign of death even before the law was given at the time of Moses proves that man was under sin before the law. They trained even over those who had not sinned in the exact way Adam did showing that the principle of sin was at work in every human. Paul present Edom as a type, a picture, a representation of Jesus. Both Edom and Jesus were completely sinless, men from the beginning, and both of them did things that had consequences for all mankind. Contrast between Edom's work and Jesus' work, but the free gift is not like the, off the first offense. For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man. Jesus Christ abounded to many, and the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by the one man's offense death reigned to the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Edom gave an offense that had consequences for the entire human race. As a result of, of Edom's offense, many died. Jesus gives a free gift that has consequences for the entire human race, but in, de in a different way. Through the free gift of Jesus, the grace of God abounded to many. Adam's work brought death, but Jesus' work brings grace. Many died, judgment resulting in condemnation, and death reigned over men. Also, St. Paul describes the result of Jesus' free gift Grace abounded to many, justification, receiving abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness and reigning in life. Sabini Morris, he is not saying that death reigned over us all because 
we all sinned. He is saying that death reigned over us all because Edom sinned. We could say that both Edom and Jesus are kings, each instituting a reign. Under Edom, death reigned. Under Jesus, we can reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. It is staggering to think of how totally death has reigned under Edom. Everyone who is born dies. The mortality rate is 100%. No one survives. When a baby is born, it isn't a question of whether the baby will live or die. They will most certainly do. They will most certainly die. The only question is when. We think of this world as the land of the living, but it is really the land of the dying and the billions of human bodies cast into the earth over the centuries prove this. But Paul says that the reign of life through Jesus is much more certain. The believer's reign in life through Jesus is more certain than death or taxes. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. The phrase, one man's offense, one man's righteous act. From this passage, Romans chapter 5, Edom and Jesus are sometimes known as the two men. Between them, the represent of all humanity, and everyone is identified in either Edom or Jesus. We are born identified with Edom. We may be born again into identification with Jesus. The idea of Edom and Jesus has two representatives of the human race and sometimes called federal theology, or Edom and Jesus are sometimes referred to as federal heads. This is because under the federal system of government, representatives are chosen and the representative speaks for the people who choose him. Edom speaks for those who he represent and Jesus speaks for his people. Again, someone may object, but I never chose to have Edom represent me. Of course you did. You identified yourself with Edom with the first sin you ever committed. It is absolutely true that we are born, we were born into our identification with Edom, but we also choose it with our individual act of sin. The phrase resulting in condemnation, resulting in justification, the outcome of this election choosing Edom or Jesus means everything, means everything. If we choose Edom, we, we, receive, we receive judgment and condemnation. If we choose Jesus, we receive the free, a free gift of God's grace and justification. The phrase, the free gift came to all men in Romans chapter 5. Does this mean that all men are justified by the free gift? Without making a personal choice, every person received the curse of Edom's offense. Is it therefore true that every person, apart from their personal choice, will receive the benefits of Jesus' obedience? Not at all. First, Paul makes it clear that the free gift is not like the offense. They are, identic they are not identical in their result or application. Second, over three verses, Paul calls the work of Jesus a free gift, and he never uses those words to apply to the work of Adam. It is simply the nature of a gift that it must be received by faith. Finally, Paul clearly teaches throughout the New Testament that all are not saved. In what sense then the free gift come to all men? It came in the sense that the gift is presented but not necessarily but not necessarily received. The idea that all men are saved by the work of Jesus, whether they know it or not, is known as universalism. If the doctrine of universalism is being taught here, Paul would be 
contradicting himself for he has already pictured men as perishing because of sin according to Harrison. Now let's see and hear the Bible reflection with application. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Adam's disobedience makes mankind sinners. Jesus' obedience makes many righteous. Each representative communicates the effect of their work to their followers. Many were made sinners. Paul emphasizes the point again. At the road, we were made sinners by the work of Adam. Of course, we chose Adam when we personally sinned. But the principle remains that since another man made us sinners, we can be made righteous by the work of another man. This is the only way for the work of Jesus to benefit us in, in any way. If every man must, must stand for himself without the representation of either Adam or Jesus, then we will all perish. <clears throat> None would be saved because each of us sins and falls short of the glory of God. Only a sinless person acting on our behalf can save us, and it is fair for him to act on our behalf because another man put us in this means by acting on our behalf. If I rob a bank and was pronounced guilty by the judge, what would happen if my friend came before the judge and said, Your Honor, I love my friend so much that I want to serve his prison time. I want to stand in his place and receive the punishment he deserves. The judge would reply, Nonsense! He will not punish you for his crime. That would not be fair. He did the crime, so he has to pay the penalty. It would only be fair for another person to pay the penalty if I was guilty because of another man's work. The person who says, I don't want to be represented by Edom or Jesus, I want to represent myself, doesn't understand two things. First, they don't understand that it really is not up to us. We did not make the roles, God did. We simply have to deal with it. Secondly, they don't understand that our personal righteousness before God is us, filthy rags. Isaiah 64, 6. To God, our personal righteousness is an offensive counterfeit. So standing for yourself guarantees your damnation. Paul has shown us that the law does not justify us. Now he shows that in itself, the law doesn't even make us sinners. Edom did that. Then what purpose does the law serve? What good is it at all? Was the giving of the law God's failed experiment? No. There is a clear purpose for the law, and part of it is so that the offense might abound. The law makes man's sin clearer and greater by clearly contrasting it with God's holy standard. The, the flows in a precious stone abound when con trusted with a perfect stone, or when put against a contrasting backdrop. God's perfect law exposes our flaws and makes us our sin abound. Then is another way that the law makes sin abound. Because of the sinfulness of my heart, when I see a line drawn, I want to cross over it. In this sense, the law makes sin abound because it draws many clear lines between right and wrong. My, that my sinful heart wants to break the break. Therefore, the law makes me sin more, but not because there is anything wrong in the law, only because there is some something deeply wrong in the human condition. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign. True righteousness to eternal true eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. If sin abounded under the law, 
then grace abounded much more under Jesus. Literally, the phrase abounded much more means superabounded. God makes His grace superabound over abounding sin. We might have expected that where sin abounded, God's anger or judgment would have abounded much more. But God's love is so amazing that grace abounded much more where we might expect wrath. If grace superabounds over sin, then we know that it is impossible to out sin the grace of God. We can't sin more than God can forgive, but we can reject His grace and forgiveness. As Paul stated before, sin reigns in death, but grace reigns also. The, the, the reign of grace is, ma, is marked by righteousness and eternal life and is through Jesus. Grace reigns through righteousness. Many people have the idea that where grace reigns, there will be a disregard for righteousness and a casual attitude towards sin. But that, isn't, but that is not the reign, the reign of grace at all. Paul wrote in another letter what grace teaches us. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in, this, in the present age. Titus chapter 2 verses 11 to 12. Grace reigns through righteousness, and grace teaches righteousness. Grace reigns to eternal life. God's grace gives us something and takes us somewhere. It gives more than just everlasting life in the sense that it will never end. Eternal life has the idea of a present quality of life. God's quality of life given to us right now, not simply when we die. The phrase grace reigns through Jesus. There is a king in the kingdom where grace reigns and the king is Jesus. A life of grace is all about Jesus and others and not about me. A life of grace doesn't look to self because it understands that this, is, this undeserved favor of God is given apart from any reason in, in self. All the reasons are in Jesus. None of the reasons are in myself. Grace doesn't train true self, but true Jesus. Even so grace might train true righteousness. Whenever grace rolls, God's righteous standard will be respected. The legalist fear is that the reign of grace will provide wicked hearts with the license to sin. But scripture doesn't share that fear. Grace does not accommodate sin. It faces it squarely and goes above sin in order to conquer it. Grace does not work, does not wink at unrighteousness. It confronts sin with the atonement at the cross and the victory won at the open tomb. Grace is no friend to sin. It is it is its sworn enemy. As it is opposed to cold and light to darkness, so grace is opposed to sin. Fire and water may as well agree in the same vessel as grace and sin in the same heart, according to Thomas Binton Brooks. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.